Welcome to E-Commerce with Coffee, a podcast powered by Amber Engine, where we share e-com secrets for brands over your favorite brew. We start with the caffeine and then leap enthusiastically into behind the scenes e-com insights that led to the success of our guests. I'm Nate Svoboda, and I'm about to serve you up the best. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to this episode of e-commerce with coffee today. I have the pleasure of speaking with Nicole Leinbach. She is the founder of retail minded and the co-founder of the independent retailer conference. So she's as an, which is an industry blog and publication um, that's really committed to helping independent retailers with the news, education, and resources that they specifically need to thrive. Um, so also providing content services, you know, to help companies looking to communicate with specifically retail audience. Now today we're really going to be diving in. Um, to how retail has shifted in recent years and what some of the biggest upcoming trends are that we should really all be thinking about. So, Nicole, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Nate. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, really excited to, to talk to you today. But, you know, before we dive into it, I know it's, you know, we're dating the episode a little bit. It's it's March and you've already gone to a several events this year. So you're a busy person. I imagine caffeine must play some role in your life. Caffeine absolutely does. So cheers to that. And yeah, it's been a great 2022, you know, retail, wholesale, it's coming back to life. And I love being able to get out there and meet with the industry, you know, leaders, the industry players, those who are actually making retail come to life. So it's been great. So how many cups of coffee do you uh, try to limit yourself to a day? Or do you just completely, you know, as many as many as it takes? Well, this is number three. So that might give you an idea. <laughs> well, hey, there we go. Um, nothing wrong with a good cup of coffee to start the day and continue the day. That's right. Um, well, you know, Nicole, you really have quite become quite the influential thought leader in retail, right? I mean, you've contributed to you know Forbes, a number of high profile publications, not to mention starting your own. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your journey and how you really came to be so invested in retail or interested in retail as well? You know, it really does go back to when I was a young girl and growing up, I would I had two sisters, a twin sister and an older sister, and my mother would take us shopping, as many moms do. And the community we lived in was north suburbs of Chicago, a town called Libertyville, but it had a local main street. And I really just found myself attracted to the businesses that brought the community to life. And when I reflect on my just my general interest in the business of retail, it does date back to those days of when I was a little girl strolling in and out of businesses, wondering, wow, this window display you know, pulled me in, or why did they do this once I was in the store, or how come this merchandise is you know, with inventory of another category. So things that really most kids probably don't think about. And by the time I was in high school, you know, I begged my parents for me to drive an hour to work at Nordstrom's versus my local mall because I wanted to learn from what I still believe is one of the best retailers out there. And so it's just been a genuine love from my very early years. And I've been really grateful along the way to work for some amazing companies, both um, directly, you know, including Adidas America when I was starting my career, um, Sears Corporation right out of college at the time I lived in Illinois. Of course, that's many years ago. I'm dating myself now, but and then countless other retailers, wholesalers, vendors, tech suppliers along the way. So given the variety of experiences that you've had, right, thinking, you know, maybe back in the last decade or so, what are really the, some of the most monumental shifts that you've personally witnessed within retail? I think communication. So when we look back to what communication within a retail used to be, it truly was brick and mortar only, right? And then of course, e-commerce came to life. And through the e-commerce journey, we've seen communication. So the connectivity of brands to consumers through their choice of words, their choice of visuals, their choice of engagement, and just the general opportunities that have opened up, including social media, it has drastically improved and changed along the way. So communication is such a vital part in bringing you know, retail to life and bringing that connectivity of consumers to brands. Yeah, no, I would 100% agree with that. And, you know, thinking, you know, maybe more specifically to the past several years, right, we've seen a lot of shifts take place when it comes to commerce, right? We see buy online, pick up in store has become a much more prevalent thing. Buy now, pay later. You have longer return windows. You can, you know, turn stores into warehouses. 
what are some resources that you think the retail industry didn't have leading into these previous three years that they're really going to need going forward? So we've been talking about omnichannel for a long time, but I think truly now more than ever, we have to have it. There are no exceptions. We absolutely need to make sure that no matter, no matter where the customer lands on their path to purchase, they are connected to not only the inventory, but the opportunity to connect with that brand. And so for me, seeing the technology that brings that to life, the omni, the connectivity, that is so important. We, again, we've talked about it for years. Um, so you're looking at the very core of it, your point of sale system, right? You need to make sure the point of sale connects to all the touch points so that you can capture transactions and make sure you understand what's going in and what's going out and what's needed, right? But having the customer loyalty tracked, having that data management, where your customers coming from before they even land with your brand, those are all critical components to making sure you can optimize your profit, basically. So, you know, obviously customer loyalty, those are things that are obviously going to be critical to a business, hopefully, obviously, to most people. Yeah. Um, you know, how many of these were already on the industry's radar pre-pandemic? And, you know, I guess on the flip side, how many really were a, a realization companies came to in recent years? I think so much was already there. I think including like, let's say that buy online, pick up in store, BOPIS, right? Curbside pickup, even the buy now, pay later which is, you know, a, a huge opportunity for brands and retailers. Um, that was already there. I think what happened during the pandemic was consumers were forced to change their habits, right? They had to step outside their comfort zones. So they began to learn about new opportunities or experiences to connect with their favorite brands or retailers. And likewise, they were challenged to often have to shop from new merchants or new vendors that they didn't because of supply chain issues or other issues or challenges. And so that pushed consumers into a place of let me try something new. So because you had both sides of the equation, offering something they may not have, or at least pushing it forward to the forefront, even though it already existed, and then consumers actually saying, okay, I have to try, it just presented opportunity in general. And now we see all of that being enhanced and improved upon, and that's what's really exciting now. No, absolutely. And going back to something you said a second ago, I think omni-channel has become a, a huge buzzword, right? I feel like everybody says it, and I would position that not everybody knows what it really means. What in your definition does omni-channel mean? So omni-channel, from my perspective, is the connectivity of customers at any touch point of their engagement with a brand. So that means that if they are on Google and searching for an item and land on your brand website, that they're able to then stay in touch with you as their path to purchase might steer them away as they navigate social media and through those algorithms competitive ads are being popped into their feed. How are we going to bring them back to that original brand they found and actually enjoyed? So having Omnichannel as an avenue to not only connect with the customer in the first place, but then stay in touch with the customer is critical. And that's just on that beginning path to purchase. Once you are actually a consumer and you've made a transaction, the Omnichannel story continues. You want to make sure as a brand you're staying in touch from a loyalty side and also from a respect side. You need to make sure that the customer respects the journey enough with you to want to purchase again. Yeah, and I, I love the one of the things that I want to really highlight there is you said every touch point, yes. right? Because a lot of people also talk about multi-channel, but I think that that's you know, more so just being on multiple channels, right? Mm -hmm. Omni, be everywhere that your consumers want to buy from you, to engage with you, to see you, right? Um, now, Although the pandemic, you know, accelerated e-com, right? We have so many people saying the stat about 10 years of growth in three months or, or something like that. Yeah. Um, and I'd say it was already growing at a fairly steady pace. Now, while we've seen a lot of companies um, will need to rethink the aspects of their consumers' touch points, right, both physical and virtual, um, the ways that a business approach these channels seems like it must be fairly different, right? So my ultimate question to you, how ahead are retailers that already have a strong digital presence? That's a great question, Nate. You know, retailers that have been forward thinkers to already be online is incredibly important. Um, brand and branding, so the brand itself and then the branding of the brand um, is absolutely essential online. I mean, especially when you start to look at the generations of which engage with your product or the inventory or the brand itself. You need to consider how they're making that engagement effort. And online is, in fact, one of the most dominant ways in which we connect with customers. 
I think it's really interesting to know that the baby boomer generation, so you know, one of our more mature buying audiences, buys more online than are some of our younger generations. And that's partly because they have more disposable income, and it's also because they have more time. And so their time is you know, opened up for them to be online or to be wherever they want to be. And so when you think about the digital component of connecting with customers, it's incredibly important. And as you know, Nate, digital doesn't just end with email or social media. There are many other touch points in which brands have to consider. Yeah, and I know you've already mentioned social, but could you maybe highlight, you know, what are some of those touch points or channels that, you know, retailers and honestly brands, you know, need to be thinking about in a holistic strategy? So from social, you have shoppable social now, okay? Shoppable social, it's a tongue twister if you say it too fast or too often, right? But shoppable social is happening. Instagram offers you that, you know, immediate click to buy. There's actually retail destinations on social sites that you can navigate and purchase from directly. Um, one of the other things I'm really enjoying that really heightened during the pandemic but already existed, so another great example of this, is that video selling. So I like to look at it as social sales. Companies such as Comet Sold that actually allow a merchant to, let's say for example, I'm going to highlight my coffee mug and talk to you about it and engage with my audience via video, pushing it out on my social media streams they're able to comment and purchase directly from that video. And that's a really great way to deliver shoppertainment, as I like to refer to it, so the engagement of customers through a retail experience through a digital avenue. So shoppertainment could be, of course, in-store or, or online. But during the pandemic, people wanted to still feel connected, and video became a heightened experience. And we definitely saw more and more people doing that. So yes, going back to your question, social media has the opportunity to connect with customers through direct purchase experience, as well as video engagement, and also through the loyalty of again and again. Customers start to look at you for entertainment, information, education. There's opportunity there to connect with customers in ways that traditional content never delivered. I, I love that you mentioned shop, uh, shoppable social, um, social shopping. Uh, I've definitely made some of my fastest impulse purchases from a video that I saw on TikTok or on Instagram. Uh, so I've definitely <laughs> fallen victim to that. Um, yeah. Yeah. I guess, you know, I, I know that you, your bread and butter is really working with independent retailers. Um, so I know I just asked about, you know, how ahead are some of the bigger players. But I, I, another thing I'm curious to know about, would you say that, you know, resource availability or, or lack thereof has been a detriment to the smaller brands or has their size and their ability to be agile and nimble compared to the larger players been more advantageous and kind of offset that? So actually both, Nate, you made two really good points there, and I think that both of them are valid. So good or bad, many smaller businesses um, were not proactive enough, even though they had the ability to be so. Instead, they were a little bit gun shy. Maybe they were, were concerned about budget or you know, their overhead being too high based on demand, maybe being lower during the pandemic. So there's a lot of you know fear sometimes that comes from the smaller business leaders and decision makers because they worry, of course, as, as they should, about operations and optimizing their budget and, for that matter, weakening their budget. So, yes, there's definitely that where those players, unfortunately, didn't excel, whereas others were like, this is an opportunity. I'm going to just dive straight into the changes and challenges, and we're going to meet with our consumers head on, and we're going to make this work. You know, and they started to introduce that um, curbside pickup and they made room in their parking lot for cars to just pull in and pull out. And they incorporated signage so that it became easier for customers to understand a lot of business in general, particularly, well, all business, but for the smaller independent merchants and even independent sellers online, communication is key. And I did mention that earlier, but having signage from a brick and mortar perspective became even in more important during the pandemic because people didn't want to talk to you and we had masks on our face and we couldn't always have easy conversation. So I honestly found a lot of success came from people just being proactive to say, I need to communicate and that's going to mean increased signage using my digital strategy to speak directly to the customers and making sure that there's an understanding of what's happening now and what changes or opportunities exist also. 
Yeah, and and uh, one of my favorite analogies that I've gotten from a, a client that I worked with previously, you know, they were just talking about how they're a smaller group, and so you know, man, we're a speedboat, and they're they're a freaking aircraft carrier, yeah. you know. So while sometimes resources can be an issue, if you have the ability to be a small team and you cater your, to your consumers, you know, sometimes if you are willing to be a first mover and you know be a trend watcher, you know, that can be advantageous to you. Um, you know, thinking now about businesses that you know, need to shift their business model in some way. What are some of the barriers to entry that, you know, current, modern and and future e-commerce retailers and brands might, you know, be wanting to look out for or plan to run into? I think the first thing that comes to mind is lack of education. They don't always know where or what to do to take their business forward. Um, and that becomes, you know, a, a huge problem because they're very busy in their day to day. So forward thinking into what's next is often a challenge for them beyond the inventory planning, right? So I think that that's really truly a problem we continuously see. It's one of the reasons we produce a conference twice a year in Vegas to help these merchants connect with industry leaders so that they have a better understanding. That said, I think that, you know, another barrier is going to be the lack of integration between technologies. So when companies invest in a technology, they need to look ahead. They need to be proactive enough to think, hey, does this integrate with either existing technologies I already have, or is this technology available to integrate into technologies I might need in the future? And that's going to also include payment applications. Payment is such a big, important piece of this puzzle. And nowadays, payment through digital connectivity is so critical, too. So integration is, is going to be definitely something I think that we have to keep our eyes out for. No, that's huge. And a lot of businesses, you know, because I think it, this is becoming less true, especially since the pandemic, but generally, you know, the presidents, the CEOs, you know, they're not really thinking about the technology, right? They have their their IT person, they're handling that. Sometimes they're a CIO, sometimes they're not. Um, but now they're really understanding that technology is what's going to drive the business forward in the future, right? And they need to make sure that we could buy a cheaper solution right now. But if that's going to create a problem for us four years down the road, we need to really be thinking about that. Um you know, see so technology you mentioned, that's obviously critical. So maybe that's part of your answer here. What are some of the most important partnerships that retailers and brands um, should be considering in order to make this entry, you know, more feasible and more successful? Well, another great question, Nate. You're full of good questions. So I think that Businesses need to be looking at their vendor relationships. So this means the people they're sourcing their inventory from to make sure that they have um, clear, easy dialogue avenues. Because during the pandemic, we did, of course, see supply chain challenges. We continue to see that. And often what happens is the vendors are going to lean towards the merchants and sellers that they have stronger relationships with. So you do want to nurture your vendor relationship because just having that avenue of connectivity is going to make or break the opportunity for you to get, let's say, inventory that you've sold out and want to reintroduce to your store. Or if there's um, a demand or a shortage of inventory, this vendor is going to keep you in mind to allocate some to you. So I, I definitely would not underestimate the value of vendor relationships. That's a good old fashioned tip, by the way, because technology is in fact very 2022, but just that that vendor partnership and relationship, that's something we cannot ignore. We have to keep that always in mind. And I would also say that, you know, businesses need to be forward thinking in their payment acceptance. So we talked briefly about payments, but not everyone is actually accepting all the payment choices. And what we're seeing from consumers is that they're looking um, often, again, across the generations, this will vary, but they're often looking, okay, I want to pay with a buy now, pay later application. That's their first choice of how they want to spend. So then they actually go to, and this does exist in the Facebook groups, whether it's Afterpay or Quadpay or any of the other big players here, and they'll go and they'll say, this is the Facebook group, I belong to Afterpay's Facebook group. Consumers share ideas on where they've been or who accepts us. Then from there, they decide where they want to spend money. So you want to be in that network, okay? That's another expanded network of consumer connectivity to brands. And I think that, you know, as a retailer, merchant, seller, you need to absolutely keep that customer preference in mind. 
And I, I love that you mentioned that because I actually had a conversation uh, a few months ago with somebody who handles, uh, it's like a crypto payment gateway, right? Yeah. And so, you know, the, the whole essence of that was, you know, consumers are going to buy however they want to buy. So why not allow them to? So, you know, I, I don't know your familiarity with this topic, but I'm just curious. Have you seen an increase, a significant increase in the numbers of people that want to make crypto payments in retail? Or is that something that's still fairly nascent and small overall? I think it's fairly small, particularly with the independent merchants. Um, even the larger big box are not wildly accepting it, so to speak. You know, they're not pushing it forward as an option quite yet. Some are, absolutely, some are, but most are not yet. So, and honestly, I'm a little bit torn on how easy that's going to like slide into the payment equation here. I think there's going to be some challenges um, because it's a bit like the stock market and there's highs and lows. So you don't ever buy things with the stock you have in the stock market, right? So I'm just curious how that will ultimately work, but it's probably going to happen one day. I just don't see it happening within the next, really within the next three years. No, that's fair. I, I don't know if I will be going and buying my Starbucks with Dogecoin in, in several years, but who knows? I mean, maybe we will. The world can change very quickly, right? As we've all seen. Um, you know, a couple other questions that I really wanted to pick your brain on, you know, Obviously, e-commerce has been a huge enabler for small businesses. Um, but that said, you know, I don't think it would be a fair or a reasonable goal to set for yourself to topple Amazon tomorrow, right? So in that context, it's different from business to business. What is a realistic outlook for small brands and retailers in e-commerce, right? How should they be going about setting, you know, uh, stretch goals, but, you know, realistic ones for themselves? So as a smaller merchant, one of the things, and you mentioned it earlier, you have as leverage is being agile and identifying ways to connect with your audience that your big box competitors simply cannot. Obviously, Amazon has some strengths that smaller businesses won't have. And that's okay. I think there's room for everyone. To be perfectly honest, Nate, I don't purchase on Amazon almost ever. I don't have a Prime membership. I prefer to shop and support my local community businesses. Um, and while I do occasionally shop e-commerce, I prefer to do some from brands that I can physically walk into stores if something doesn't fit or I don't like it for easy returns. That's just my preference. But obviously, I understand all of this as a, you know, a retail researcher, if you will. I think that small businesses need to dive more heavily into that customer care, that good old fashioned TLC, red carpet, customer service, wanting customers to return to them because they're going to deliver on experiences, products, customer service that Amazon simply cannot compete with. You know, Amazon is robotic in many ways. You know, I've actually had the fortunate experience to tour their warehouse facilities and it's impressive. I'm not going to lie. It's pretty darn impressive. Um, but you know, when we look at our smaller businesses, we don't want to scare them because they don't need to be scared. There's an absolute opportunity for them. And we see it. I see it all the time across tons of categories of retail. Um, it's simply the ones that are saying, I need to get more creative and I need to be more proactive to connect with the customer. Uh, one per store in particular, it's called Interior Delights, and that's based in Parker, Colorado. They started doing a you know buy in advance so they were able to actually have a better understanding of inventory but they did it with a sense of enthusiasm with their customers so now they knew exactly what they were buying that's already been sold and the delivery is basically 30 days later that's because they have those good vendor partnerships and this is a home-based store you know for home interior goods and they have built a huge business around that you know it's almost like a trust they can guarantee on with every month so there's definitely opportunities yeah, no, I love that. And and this I'm not going to ask you this yet, but my last question for you is going to be, you know, what is your favorite retail experience you can recall in recent memory? So hopefully that wasn't the answer because I'd love to get another example from you. Yeah. But, you know, first, um, you know, I, obviously I doubt that retail is ever going to go away. Right. Some people are saying that its importance is going to wane over time. But, you know, that's that's arguable from both sides of the aisle. Um now, under the assumption that e-commerce continues to grow rapidly and isn't solely a pandemic trend, what must retailers do moving forwards specifically to ensure that they are relevant in our increasingly digital world? So they need to be everywhere the customer is. We talked about Omnichannel earlier, but I see a lot of merchants shy away from either having a digital presence or a social media activity. Capturing a handle on social media 
isn't going to do anything for you if you don't use that handle. So you need to make sure you're actually engaging with consistency to make sure that your customer is also consistent and caring about your brand. And that goes to every single touch point we talked about. So for example, I'll use Yelp as an example. Um, you know, I'm, I'm actually moderating one of their women's summits again this year, and I've done this in the past for them. They're a wonderful company that really, really aims to support smaller merchants, mid-sized merchants in particular, because as consumers, you often go to Yelp, right, to find where the destination is you want to go. I find it interesting that Yelp says their data tells us more consumers go to Yelp to shop for retail than restaurants. And historically, I feel as a consumer, I used to think it was restaurants first, retail second, but that's actually shifted. So consumers are telling us we want to support local businesses, but if you're a business and you don't even have a profile on Yelp, which is free to do, how will you be found? So having the connectivity, that omni-connectivity of just destination, finding out who you are is so important. Be everywhere because if you're not there, customers cannot find you. I love that example because, you know, some people say they don't want to, you know, I'm not going to build a Facebook page. Why does it matter? Well, because someone may stumble upon it, right? And you don't, you don't want to not have it because, you know, obviously the, the risk of that is too great. Um, I, I know, really want to hear your answer. I think based on what we've talked about, you know, I, my fiance and I went to a, a local plant store recently. It was a small shop. They had a few, you know, obviously people that, that all worked in the store. And I was astounded by the fact that, you know, they came up, they literally said, okay, of the plants that we're buying, this one needs filtered water. These two can take tap water. This one, you know, they were giving you all this information that I'm never going to get if I go to Home Depot to buy these plants right. or if I, you know, I don't know if I'd buy plants online necessarily, but, um, you know, so it's astounding because that's really striking to me that if a store isn't offering some type of experience like that, what benefit do I as a consumer have to buy from them as opposed to just going to the Walmarts to, you know, the et mm -hmm. So I know you gave that example a minute ago. Um, if you have another one, what is, you know, your favorite or one of your favorite retail experiences you can recall in recent memory and what specifically made it so great? I'm going to use one just from this past weekend. So I was in Nashville, Tennessee. And I was on 12th Avenue, which is known for independent stores, independent restaurants. And I had been there before, so I knew what I was basically walking into, so to speak, or Ubering to, I should tell you, because I took an Uber to get there. And when I got there, I went to a store called Emerson Grace. I have been receiving their emails for years, because when I first went there years ago, I really enjoyed it. And I was so excited to return. And in my mind, I knew I wanted to get a new denim jacket something I want for spring. It's something I simply needed. I was saving my shopping destination, if you will, until I got to that store. So weeks and weeks had gone by in multiple other cities, and here I am finally in Nashville. Long story short, get in there, and all the denim jackets they had, even though I had seen what they were sharing on social media and online, were not for me. They either didn't fit, or I didn't like the style, or the wash of it, whatever it may have been. And so I was disappointed but you know just having a friendly chat with the gal working and she was first and foremost she was informative and so when you represent any company as a small business or a big one you are a brand ambassador for that business so i felt that she truly fit the aesthetics of what emerson grace is as a business she was friendly she was stylish she was informative and engaging those were all really good things um so I said to her, okay, do you guys have any more coming in? She goes, actually, we don't. She goes, this was our last shipment until probably June. You mentioned you need it by April. She goes, but I'll tell you what, there's ABC stores nearby, and I know that they all have great assortment of clothing. Now, two reasons I found this awesome. One, those are, in theory, her competitors, but two, she took the time to thoughtfully want to fulfill what I needed as a customer, okay? So the big takeaway here is that she was thinking about her community and what would be considered a like-minded business that could potentially be competitive. And she looked at me and she's just like, I know you need this. I'd love for you to get this. She wanted to fulfill a customer care at that moment for me. I didn't make a transaction at her store that day, but I'll for sure return there because she was so great. And I think businesses need to remember the people working for them represent their brand and business. So you want to give the time and energy to make sure those people are trained adequately, um, know what kind of care you want delivered upon your customers and guests. And ultimately, just what does that red carpet customer service look like for you? You know? 
Yeah, I love that. And, you know, this is that's a very different example from this. But, you know, it's like when, you know, some a business gets an order wrong that you place, but then they're responsive to it and they try to fix the issue. And, you know, it's like I'm going to be more likely to go back to that business because they left a good taste in my mouth. Right. They're building that brand and building that relationship with me. So different example, but I think overall sort of same principle. Yeah. Um, well, Nicole, this, I, first of all, I feel like we could talk for hours about this stuff. This has been a fast, I've learned a lot, a fascinating conversation. Where can our listeners uh, get in touch with you um, if anything that we've talked about resonated and, you know, they want to learn a little bit more about you? Yeah, oh, there are my dogs. So or your dogs. They wanted to say hello, all three of them. <laughs> They're barking out there. But um, Retail Minded, my handle on Twitter is Retail Minded. Um, on Instagram, it's Retail Minded World. And, of course, RetailMinded.com. Awesome. Well, Nicole, I uh, really, really appreciate you sharing time out of your insanely busy schedule to speak with us, um, but look forward to having you on for future conversations. Yeah, thanks, Nate. I enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Thanks, Nicole. That's it for this episode of E-Commerce with Coffee, powered by Amber Engine. If you haven't gotten your fix yet, be sure to get more e-commerce brand secrets on our website at amberengine.com. And don't forget to subscribe for more episodes. 